um, I was in, in church and Pastor Ray was speaking and I just wanna say, whether it's Pastor Ray or the other ones that have spoken or whatever, that we really are blessed to have a staff that is as deep and rich as what we have here at, at Grace. And uh, <clears throat> I will say that Pastor Ray, he preached up a storm. Um, he, he did, um, but, uh, but, but, the, but <laughs> my, my kids are like, Dad, your jokes are the worst. I'm like, yeah, but the Lord loves me anyway. But, uh, but, but, but they do such a great job, and, and I don't know. I know you're not supposed to compare, and, and I don't want to get into that comparison trap, but I just want to say that I feel like we have as good a staff, as good a place um, as there is, and I just pray that you would love on our staff, tell them how great they are, whatever they do, whatever they do, let, bless them, because they, they really are fantastic. And so as, uh, as Pastor Ray was speaking, I, uh, it was towards the end of his message, and he likes to fish, and he talked about taking the bait, um, because, you know, the, the fish go after the bait, and when he said that, I mean, I was sitting back over there, I, I, I just, I, it was like I got teleported for a moment, of just my mind was, was just sort of going with taking the bait, taking the bait, taking the bait, and I started thinking, man, I wonder, I wonder how many of us take the bait in so many ways, and we don't see it, and we end up thinking that we're doing something right, or we think that we're following the Lord, or we think that we're sort of advancing his kingdom or whatever, but really we have taken the bait. And so all I could think about was this. And, and, and I'm not an avid fisherman, but, but I do know that when they create these lures, um, sometimes they create them shiny so the fish see them. Sometimes they create them with a smell that, that the fish go after. Sometimes they create them that look like they're injured as they're going through and, and, and whatever it may be. When the fish go after that bait, what they don't realize is they're taking that to their demise. Unless somebody in the boat decides to take the hook and pull it out of its mouth, and I'm sure that's not a fun procedure for the fish, but they're thrown back in. And sometimes, as pastors, what we have to do is, is we have to take that hook that Christians have taken the bait and pull it out and throw you back in so that you don't go to your own demise. And sometimes that can be tough because when you're me and, and you have to take that hook out, sometimes people can get frustrated and upset. But we're in a series called Identity Crisis. And I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear my heart. Please hear my heart. Um, don't read into stuff. Just listen to what I'm saying. Hear, hear my heart. I'm convinced, and, and, I, and I don't mean this in, any, in a bad way. I'm just convinced that the American church, by and large, is fundamentally in an identity crisis. I feel like we have taken the bait in so many ways and we're sort of going after so many different things that, that we've sort of sometimes, at, it, 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 more times than often, we've, we've lost sort of the central focus of what it is we're supposed to do and who it is that we're supposed to be. And this is not, this is not something new. This is something that the church has struggled with from the beginning. Every one of these New Testament epistles are written to help a church understand who they are so that they don't have an identity crisis. And one of the things, as we read in the New Testament text, one of the struggles in the first century, and it's a struggle that's happened all throughout Christianity, it's a struggle that's happening now, is, is what we t t use this term in the academic um, circles, it's called syncretism. And syncretism is when you take certain things, maybe a belief, maybe a strong soapbox issue or maybe something that you brought into your Christianity or maybe a persuasion or, or whatever it may be, and you fuse it or we fuse it with Jesus. And, and what happens is, is that Jesus then becomes this person that supports or it it's only sees it this way. And then what happens is, is we have a very different set of Christianity than what pure, unadulterated Christianity is. Because Jesus doesn't fuse with anything. He is on his own, the God of the universe, the savior of all humanity, the king of kings and lord of lords. He does not need something else to prop him up at all. And so you see in these New Testament texts this this sort of overwhelming pastoral call by all the writers to tell these Christians in all these towns, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait of the world. Don't take the bait of culture. Don't take the bait of, of whatever it may be, the religion that you came out of. Don't, don't do that. 
Christ and Christ alone. And so Paul writes to a church that's in the city of Ephesus. Um, Pastor Michael talked a little bit about this when he did his sermon. He talked to you about the Pauline indicative and the imperative. He talked about how Paul says who we are and then he tells us to live it out. And so in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, he sort of tells everybody who they are. This is who you are in Christ. Like, this is who you are. And then he tells them in chapter four, verse one, we'll pick up here. This is what he says. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. That's so foreign to us. Most of us would go, you know, the, that, that Roman empire imprisoned him improperly. You know, they, 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 they need to be whatever. And that may all be true, but, but Paul didn't have that mindset. Paul said, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. I wouldn't be here if God didn't want me to be here. I, I, would, I wouldn't be in this place if this is, wasn't where God wanted me to be. Doesn't mean that how I got here was right. Doesn't mean that some of the things that have gone on were right. But Paul's perspective was different. And this is why understanding who we are and understanding what it really means to be a follower of Jesus is so important. Like, I, like I, and I hope you can understand my heart here with this. I would rather offend with the gospel than to offend with something else. I, I'd rather you get mad at me really telling you what it means to be a follower of Jesus than to get mad at me for something else. I mean, I could talk about my opinions. I got plenty of them. I got, my wife always says, man, if the church knew how opinionated you were about everything, they wouldn't believe it. They would not believe it. I mean, I have to hold all that back. I have to pull my tongue back. I have to do all kinds of stuff because what I don't want to do is I don't want to put stuff in the place where people trip over that and miss Jesus. But, but if I offend you by telling you that really following Jesus is serious business and, and that we really need to pay attention to it because we can drift. If, if, you, go, if you go into the New Testament, you'll see there's so many passages we're, 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 we're told, pay attention. You can have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Jesus said to many people, he says, you don't have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And, and so if we're not like serious about what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, we'll miss some of these texts and miss some of what the scripture's telling us and we'll get a bad or misaligned Identity, and we don't want to do that. So Paul says he's a prisoner for the Lord. He's like, I'm here. If, if, if I'm here, I'm going to be doing Jesus' work. I'm not going to be complaining. I'm not, I'm not going to be telling everybody how wrong it is. I'm going to be doing the work of the Lord. I'm going to stay focused on the mission. As a prisoner of the Lord, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. He says, I've already told you in the first three chapters who you are. I've, I've mentioned all these things to you. I've said these things to who you, who you are. And now what I want you to do is I want you to walk it out. He doesn't say use your words. He doesn't say post on social. He says walk it out. Like live it. The, the, the actual embodiment of who you are, we should walk out. We should walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. To make this simple, what he's saying is he's saying be who you are. Don't be something else. Don't fuse Jesus with other stuff. He says, I want you to walk out this calling to which you've been called. Listen, with all humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Now, I don't want to come across as being snarky or giving anybody a hard time because that's not what I'm trying to do. But I'm going to tell you as a Christian, just an observation as a pastor, just as an observation, I don't think the American church is primarily known for humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love. And that's a shame, because that's who we should be. And I know people go, yeah, but you don't understand. We, we, gotta, we gotta be like John the Baptist. Okay, listen to me. These epistles are written to the church. This is 99% of all of us, this is what we're called to be. If God's called you to be John the Baptist, go be John the Baptist. But don't be irritated and don't be mad when you lose your head. 
Because when God calls you to that ministry, you're go it's going to cost. People go, I should say this. I can't believe they won't listen to me. They never listen to you. This world is at enmity with God. It's not a friend of God. It's not gonna be because you stand up at your work and tell everybody what you think is right. They're all gonna go, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. We're gonna convert right now. Doesn't usually happen that way. This is what we should be known for. Humility, gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Listen, eager, eager to maintain the unity of of the spirit. Again, I'm not trying to give anybody a hard time. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm just saying a casual observer should be able to know that the last thing the American church was doing was doing during COVID was being eager to maintain the unity of the spirit. We didn't do that at all. It's like it was like a it was a mess. Christian calling out Christian, people, people leaving Thanksgiving dinners, not talking with their families anymore, all kinds of stuff. This is who we're called to be. You, you wonder why the next generation isn't coming to church? It's because we're not living the life we should be living. What we're doing is, is we're enculturating a lot of the world with Jesus, and what we've done is we've created sort of a foreign to Scripture Christianity. And so Paul's very clear here. This is, this is who we should be. And he tells us in chapter four, you should go home and read chapter four this weekend. He, he says that, he says that the, the way this works to, to cultivate all of this is that God has put certain people in the local church. He says in verse 11, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for what? To equip the saints. That's you. You're the saints. You go, well, Chip, I don't feel like I'm much of a saint. None of us live up to that on a regular basis, but we're saints, not based on what we do, but based on what Jesus has done for you and me. We're the holy ones of God. You go, well, I look more H-O-L-E-Y than H-O-L-Y, Chip. I get it. Like, we, we've, none of us have arrived. If it weren't for grace, we wouldn't be saved, but he's put this to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ so that we look like Jesus. This, this, is, this is what we're called to do. We're called to look like Jesus. And people go, well, yeah, well, Jesus, he flipped tables. Yeah, he, he did. He did that as a prophetic act against the temple to show the temple that it was gonna be destroyed. And if God has called you to go flip a table, then go do that. But the average Christian is not called to flip tables. We're called to live in humility and gentleness and bear everything in love, and we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's who we're called to be. That's our identity. And so he goes on then, after he's told them, hey, we want to build up, he says, hey, listen, I don't want you to walk. And Pastor Michael did a great job. I don't want to spend too much time here. But he says, I don't want you to walk is the Gentiles do. They're Gentiles, by the way. He's writing to the church at Ephesus that's primarily Gentile. He's saying they're no longer Gentile. He's calling them the people of God. He's calling them the Israel of God. He says that in chapter two. He says the two have become one. There's no longer a wall of partition. The people of God are the people of God. They come out of everything. He says don't walk as the Gentiles walk. You're no longer those people. As they do in the futility of their minds, they're darkened, they're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them due to the hardness of their heart. They become callous and given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And he says, but that's not the way you learned Christ. That's, that's, not, that's not who you are. Like, that's not how we live. And he tells them to, to take off the old and to put on the new. And then he says this. He says, let no corrupting talk. What does that mean? That's words that attack others. Those are words that are condescending to others. We, we've almost made that a virtue in the American church to tear down whatever side we don't like. 
And folks, I'm going to tell you whether you want to hear it or not, because it's sometimes tough to take that bait out of somebody's mouth and throw them back in so they don't go to their demise. Scripture is very clear in James 3. You can't bless God with the same tongue that you curse people that are made in his image. And we've almost made that a virtue because we've taken the bait. We've allowed the world to sort of define how we live and how we, and, we, and then we sort of bring Jesus in and we pick and choose a couple of cherry picked verses to make Jesus look like he's Rambo. You know, and, and in, in reality, if Jesus wants to be Rambo, he can be Rambo because he's without sin. We're, we're not those people. And, and, and so we, we should be living as scripture says for us to live. And we'll get into this in a minute, even more so. But he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up. Like this is the call, this is the clarion call for all of us who say we believe in Jesus. We should be people that are gentle, who are humble, who bear with one another, who go the extra mile, who, 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 who give in, who, who are willing. And you say, well, Chip, that doesn't work very well in this world. No, it doesn't. But it surely lays up treasures in the world that counts. And that's what we're after. Like, 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 I, I mean, I, I, I want you to hear my heart. I, I'm not trying to get you to live the greatest portion of whatever it is right now. I'm trying to get you ready for your true home that's coming one day when you're going to walk with God. Because I'm going to have to give an account for how well I prepared you for the heavenly city. Not for how well I prepared you to live in this world to get everything this world has to offer. That's not, that's not my job. Does it mean that I don't want you to have a nice car? Does it mean that I don't want you to have a nice house? It doesn't mean that I hope your house didn't flood. It doesn't mean that I hope you can always pay for your bills. That's not, I, I do. But I can't guarantee you that as a pastor. I can't guarantee you that this life is going to be awesome. What I can guarantee you is those of us who follow Jesus are going to have the greatest eternity that we could ever even imagine. And that's where we put all of our eggs. And so... He says, good for building up is fits the occasion. That's great, fits the occasion. We, we normally, we don't even judge the room. We just tell everybody, no, it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And listen, and do not grieve who? The Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Wow. Like read chapter four of Ephesians. Read, read the whole epistle and, and, and see what God's called us to be. And then ask the question is, are we, are we taking the bait? Or are we, are, we, are we trying to figure out how to make all this great and, and make it the comfortable for us when we're told in scripture, all through scripture, this world's never gonna be comfortable. This world's never going to fall in line with what God wants, this world's passing away. We're strangers and pilgrims. We're a peculiar people. We're, we're headed to another city. Our citizenship is in heaven, Paul says in Philippians 3. We're, we're a unique people that live differently than the rest of the world. And that's who we're called to be. That's our identity. So in what ways are we taking the bait? Let me get, let me get real specific here. We take the bait when we wanna win like the world rather than winning like Christ. And I don't know that we know the difference. I don't know if we know what it really means to win like Jesus, but I think we definitely know what it looks like to win like the world. And I will tell you that Christians in America are consumed with winning. We're consumed with it. And you go, Chip, nah, you're, being, you're being too hard you, right, right this weekend, this is too hard. No, just sit down with Christians. I mean, I do it all the time. I sit down and it, it takes just about three minutes of pleasantries and then you'll hear something like this. And you know this is true. I'm not making this up. You know this is true. Can't afford to lose what we have. Hear it all the time. What? Like, what do you have here that's so great? Seriously. In fact, from what I read in scripture, we should be willing to lose everything in pursuit of Jesus. 
I mean, seriously, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not trying to be snarky. I'm trying to be your pastor and say, hey, sometimes it's not nice when I have to pull that hook out, but I'm trying to keep you from going down a path that is not the biblical path we need to be going down. You know this, you hear this regularly. People will say this, they'll say, if we don't fight, we won't have Christianity in America. Can I tell you as your pastor, that is a crazy statement. Read scripture. The gates of hell will not prevail against God's church. Period. Do you realize the amount of crazy people that have tried to snuff out the church throughout the last 2,000 years? And guess what? They're dead and the church is still alive and well and kicking in the world. See, you're thinking like the world. You're not thinking like the gospel. You're not thinking like Jesus when you say these things. Because read the book of Revelation. Do we lose? What are you so consumed about? Man, if we would spend more time winning souls than trying to win arguments, the church would be so much better. All right, I knew, I, knew, I knew when I was trying to take those hooks out, this would not be a fun one, but, but, I'm, but I'm gonna be your pastor and I'm gonna tell you the truth. People say, we gotta take back the culture. To what? Do you wanna read scripture with me? Do you wanna come hang out with me on, on a weekday and let's read scripture? Nowhere in here does it say that we're going to have somehow redeem everything. You know, you know when that happens? The only person who can redeem this world is Jesus. And you know what he's gonna do? He's gonna bathe it in fire and he's gonna reset it to where it, it needs to be. You and I are not gonna do that. So we're consumed with winning. And we gotta ask the question, what does it really mean to win? Like what does it really mean to win? Does it mean that we change culture? Is that what it means to win? Does it mean that we gotta get the right candidates elected? Is that, is that what it means? Is that what it means to win? Is it possible that we have enculturated the world's ways into God's ways and we have the whole notion of winning wrong? Like we've taken the bait. We, we, if Paul were to come and write to us, he, he might say things that we didn't even expect. We, we think he might be saying one thing. I think he would be saying something completely different. He would say, we don't look a lot like Jesus. And so the question is, what does it look like to win like Jesus? Well, guess what? He told us. He told us exactly what the blessed ones were. He said, this is what it looks like to win. And it doesn't look anything like the world. Here's what he says. You wanna know what it looks like to win like Jesus? We have our pride broken. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is what it looks like to win. This is what a good pastor should tell their congregation because this is what Jesus said. It's not my opinion. It's, it's not what I love to hear all the time. I don't wanna hear my pride to get broken. I don't wanna hear, but that's the right truth of scripture. This is what it looks like to win. Recognizes this world is fundamentally broken. Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because this world is broken and we mourn. We, we seek God. I, mean, I, mean, I, was, I was completely shaped in my college days at Westmore Church of God. The pastor of the church that I went to, his name was Floyd McClung. Every single day you could go to that church sometime in the afternoon one or two o'clock, and you could walk into the sanctuary. <clears throat> and you were told, don't go in the sanctuary, pastor's praying. He'd be up in the balcony, and you could hear him wailing. God, there's so many lost in Cleveland, Tennessee. Lord, help them to come to Jesus. And when he would leave, you could walk up to where he was at, and you could touch the carpet, and it was wet from his tears. That shaped a young man. That shaped me. It shaped me into who I am because I realized that's, that's the mission. 
We're called to go into the world. We're called to win people to Jesus. That's, that's, our, that's our focus. That's our mission. And do we take the bait? And it, it feels good for a moment. It feels right. It's shiny. It's attractive. It smells good. We were fighting off the other fish for our territory. But is, is that really what it means to win? What does it mean to win? Giving up our strength for others' weakness. Blessed are the meek. That's what that word means. It means you and me give up some strength to help those who are weak. And you go, yeah, well, that doesn't work really well in this world. No. I've, I've said for years, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't work at all if this life is all that there is. It's the worst teaching ever if this is all that there is. That's why Machiavelli said, hey, you want to be good in this world, you got to learn to be bad. You got to learn to, to not be good because if you're good, people will take advantage of you. You're not going to get everything that this world has for you. You better learn to be bad. You better learn to take control. You better learn to fight. I'm here to tell you, I'm going with King Jesus. And if he says, this is what it looks like to win, I want to be the blessed people that he calls us to be. I don't want to be something other, and I don't want to have an identity crisis. He goes on to tell us, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're so concerned with everybody else. We're so concerned with everybody else's righteousness. We're to be concerned with ours. Do you realize how broken we are? Do you realize if, you, if everybody, if we, had, if we could attach like, you know, um, things to our head and everything that we thought was played on LED screens above our head, we'd be, we'd be not wanting to let everybody see what we're thinking. When you're in line at Publix and it's not going fast. <laughs> when you're stuck in traffic. When somebody's telling you something that you don't want to hear. He says, blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. They'll be satisfied. How about giving up the right to justifiably punish? He said, blessed are the merciful. That's who we're called to be. We're called to be people that extend mercy to people that don't deserve it. And you go, I'm not doing that. Okay, hold on now. That's exactly what Jesus did for you. It's what he did for me. We're to, supposed to extend that to others. This is what it looks like to win. Looking out for others. Blessed are the pure in heart. People who aren't just looking for themselves. They're pure in their hearts. They recognize that people are valuable. And people have dignity. And people matter. Desiring the end of hostility. Blessed are the peacemakers. We're not peacekeepers. We're peacemakers. We go into areas where there's hostility and we bring peace. That's who we're called to be. In the American church today, like, no. We want to we, we wanna fight at all costs. We'll let our tongues run down people. We'll, we'll do it all. And it's like, stop. Don't take the bait. These are the blessed people. Being willing to suffer. Isn't it interesting at the very end of all this, he says, and you know what? If you're really gonna live all this thing out, guess what? You're probably gonna be persecuted for righteousness sake because this stuff doesn't work in the world, but it's what it looks like to win like Jesus. This is who we are. This is who the people of God are. We're strangers. We're pilgrims in this world. And it's time that we have a moment I like, like Amos says, prepare to meet your God to Israel. They've gone and done stuff. They've walked away from God. And he says, prepare to meet your God. You know what we're called to do. This is, I'm not telling you something up here. You can't go, oh, Chip's wrong. I'm reading you scripture. It's not like I'm up here just ranting about whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, as your pastor, like, I feel this. Like, I, I love you enough to tell you the truth. I want our church to be a light to this community. I want to do it differently. I want to see revival. I want to not see 20 people baptized. I want to see 2,000 people baptized. 
We take the bait when we spend more time fighting for issues rather than living out the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to me, because this is important. We're not called to fight. We're called to walk. Walk in a manner. No longer walk as the Gentiles do. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, when you put on the armor of God, you would think, wouldn't you think, after putting on suiting up the armor of God, you'd go fight. You know what Paul says? He says, stand. He doesn't say to fight. Why do you not fight? Because the war's won. Jesus has won the war. We're just here to tell people that they can walk in the freedom, in the salvation, in the forgiveness of sins. And the way that we live makes the difference. We're called to walk this thing out. He says, don't walk any longer like this. Don't, don't do these things. Live in such a way that people ask. If, if, we could, if we could get this, that it's not the words that we spew, it's not the things that we say, it's what we do, it's how we live. Live in a way where people ask you, they see your kindness. Why did you do that? Well, I, I was living life and I met Jesus and he's changed my life and I'm not perfect, but I really try to be kind. Like I, I, I'm always, every time I go to the grocery store, every time I go by any place, I'm always going, God, is there anybody here that I can be kind to? Is there anybody here that, 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 I, can, that I can bless? Is there anything I can do to be kind to these people? Or generosity, being generous. You know, many of us have been blessed. I've been blessed more than I should have ever been blessed in my life. And there you go, the Lord's saying, listen to Chip right now. He's telling you the truth. It's, it's like, and, 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 and by being blessed, I, I can be generous. I don't keep it, I wanna give, I wanna be generous. I want people to go, why are you so generous? Well, I'm generous because there's somebody that was so generous to me that it changed my life. Humility, patience that we listen. Like, like these are the things that we should live as believers where people ask us because the more we fight, the more we divide. And the more we divide, the less people we're gonna be able to present the gospel to. I'm not here to fight. I'm here to be your pastor and love you in ways that maybe at times can hurt a little bit. Maybe you don't like it that I'm pulling that hook out but I'm doing it because I care. I, I really believe we are in a moment, in my 54 years, I've never been in a moment like this. I, I believe we're in a moment where God is really calling us to really evaluate what does it mean to truly, authentically be followers of Jesus. Because I believe the world needs to see it more than ever. And the last thing I'll tell you is, is we take the bait when we can't control our tongue. And you know that, come on, you know that. You know the tongue is life and death. You know the scriptures. You know that even if you don't even know the Bible, you know that your tongue can hurt people. And you know that other people's tongue can hurt you. you know, that's why Paul says, don't let any corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Don't run people down. I've said this for 14 years and I will say it till the day they put me in the grave or Jesus comes back. Listen to me. We can make a point or we can make a difference. You're not gonna make both. And we get to choose. You wanna make a point at work? That's great. I wanna see us make a difference. This is, this is why this stuff is so, so, so important. In the end of Romans, and go home and read this. The, 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 the Romans 16 talks about that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. But then it says that the people that have rejected God are under his wrath. They shouldn't have rejected God, but they've worshiped all kinds of other things. And the progression gets worse and worse and worse and worse as you go down. And we cherry pick a few sins out of there and run out there and whatever, but we don't re read all of them. And we surely don't read it in the cadence where it gets worse every one. And, and it ends by saying, though they know God's righteous decree, that they who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. 
This is like the worst of the worst. I mean, this is, this is where Paul is saying, this is how bad it gets when you take the bait and you go away from God. This is how bad it gets. And I have just chosen a couple of the sins at the bottom of the list that nobody ever really says anything about because we don't really want to deal with the sins that could be dealing with us. Th these are the sins that you're going in the wrong direction when you do these things or you give approval to people who practice these things. And I'm just gonna read them to you. And if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, great. But here's some of the things that we're told we shouldn't do and we shouldn't give approval to. Strife, deceit, slander, haughtiness, boastfulness, foolishness, ruthlessness. I look at that list and I go, man, like, some of these are almost celebrated by Christians. And these are the sins at the very bottom of the list that show us walking away from God. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. We're called to be different. We're called to be authentic. We're called to be real. We're called to be the people that follow Jesus. And you can't be right with God and then run down those made in his image. I've been saying this for 14 years. You can't be right with God and wrong with people. It just doesn't work. Your vertical and my vertical relationship with God is shown in the horizontal treatment that we have of people. And just, and, just, and just to lay this out so that you can hear this, in the book of Revelation, we know about this dude that accuses. We call him the devil. We call him Satan. You, you, you've heard the name. He says, the salvation and power and the kingdom of God and authority of Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. The old enemy accuses you. You, you know, here, here's the beauty. This is the, this is the real, like, powerful thing. The word accuse in Greek, it's the word that we get our English word category from. The devil sorts you and me into categories. When we sort people into categories, we're doing the work of the devil. And the American church sorts all kinds of people into categories. Don't take the bait. You're, you're better than that. We're called to be people that truly follow Christ. Who are we sorting people into? Where do we really need to repent? Where do we need to fall on our knees and say, God, you know what? I've, I've taken the bait, man. I've taken the bait, and I'm really not living this thing out the way I'm supposed to, but I want to. And I'm going to tell you, your pastor, don't take the bait. You're not those people. You are blood-bought children of the Most High God. That's who you are. You're forgiven. You're chosen. You're accepted. Don't let the enemy say, oh, you were an adulterer. You were a drunkard. You were this. No, no, no. I had that washed on the day I accepted Christ. I stand in the holiness and righteousness of God. Don't sort people into categories. Don't do it.